Good morning from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We will get started broadcasting globally. We have over 150 major global institutional investors from North America, Europe, and Asia registered for this presentation. I'm Rob Domenko of TMX Group. Thank you for joining our quantitative broker Quant Brains webinar hosted by TMX. QB supports our max five-year, 10-year interest rate futures in addition to our core equity index future, the S&P TSX 60. We are pleased to support their progressive platform, which has been highlighted to us in very positive terms by numerous core clients. If you have any questions during the webinar, there is a real-time Q&A function. If possible, we will try to respond during this webinar, or we will follow up with you directly post-presentation. This is being recorded and is available for replay by QB and TMX. My contact details, as well as Neil Salter and Joyce Medeiros at QB, are on the event invitation. You can also reach me on Bloomberg. It is my pleasure to introduce Luc Fortin, President and CEO of the Montreal Exchange and Global Head of Trading at TMX Group. Luke, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you uh, for joining us this morning. I think uh, you know we're very pleased that so many of you have accepted the invitation to be able to gather with us virtually uh, so that we can provide you with relevant, uh, very relevant insights during these uh, rather unprecedented times. You know, for TMX, it's been absolutely paramount since the beginning of this crisis that we continue to be there for you. Uh, where there is such uncertainty in these markets, we understand the importance of our role to provide stable, reliable markets uh, to, you know, in order to uh, give you the opportunity to actively manage uh, your trading and your investments. You know, what we are really, really proud of is that we've been very quickly uh, able to adapt to these, you know, unforeseen situations. More than 95% of our staff are now operating remotely. Market operation teams are 100% functional. Our electronic platforms are handling the volatility and increased market activity very well. We work very hard every day to earn your trust and to ensure that you can rely on our marketplace. Um, we also work very hard every day to adapt and to continue to interact and to provide added value, uh, like the event that we're doing today. Uh, this is just one of the examples of being able to adapt, and we're very happy to host this virtual event jointly with quantitative brokers. We also know, uh, just as you do, that while we can't predict what the markets will go, you know, will go back to normal and what the new norm will look like, uh, like in every crisis before this one, we will at some point establish a, a new norm. That is why TMX, we're continuing to execute. You know, we're not sitting on our hands. We're not holding back. It's really important that we continue executing on our strategy while adapting from a timing and execution perspective. We're forging ahead with a number of key initiatives. Uh, you know, for our derivative business, these initiatives for 2020 and early 2021 uh, include, you know, a number of, uh, a number of key uh, drivers that will really transform who we are as an organization. So off the coattails of our success in our phase one of our extended hours in the Europe, uh, Asia Pacific uh, and our extended trading hours are, you know, sort of our sights in terms of what comes next. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at phase two to launch somewhere uh, in mid to uh, late 2021. Uh, this year is really a year of transition where we're working on establishing all the regulatory uh, necessity to and, and consultations with the industry to, to really drive this forward. Um, another really important and very exciting uh, announcement is our new Cora Futures, which we'll be launching on June 12. Uh, this is going to coincide with the Bank of Canada, assuming the, the administrative oversight of the Enhanced Cora Index. This is really a statement of our commitment to accompany the Canadian market in its transitioning uh, of, its bench, uh, of its benchmark. You know, we've been working hand in hand with the Bank of Canada and industry players to ensure that you know, this sees a timely launch and we're very excited to see that happening. Uh, also towards the end of 2020, you'll see the launch of our two year futures, the CGZ. That is really a complement to really establishing a full uh, and complete yield curve, uh, building off the success of our five year uh, uh, futures contract, our CGF, which was relaunched in, uh, in 2019. Just anecdotally, CGF is holding steady near its open interest records uh, that, were, that were set uh, despite you know, significant market volatility uh, in, in February. So also coming up in, in Q1 2021 is the launch of our equity dividend futures to complement our suite of, uh, of equity pro product offering. The, uh, the SSF uh, hit an all-time high in terms of open interest of a million shares uh, earlier this week. 
we see continued adoption and and you know gather, gathering global interest uh, from global clients to this particular product. So we're very excited about this. So as you can see, we're hard at work plugging away for you. And despite these market challenges, we we remain in a strong position to continue servicing you and providing you products and services that you that we deem you all need because you're telling us you need these products. We know that as clients that you're also hard at work trying to pull through these uh, these challenging times. So we're really, really pleased to be hosting this quantitative brain seminar event. And at this point, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, you know, our, our key speaker today, Rob Olmgren. Uh, Rob is uh, co-founder and chief scientist at, at Quantitative Broker. Uh, he, he holds a PhD in applied and computational mathematics from Princeton, uh, an MS in applied mathematics from Harvard, uh, and a bachelor's in both physics and mathematics. Before he founded QB in 2008, uh, Rob uh, managed, uh, was a managing director and head of quantitative strategies uh, in the electronic trading services at, at B of A. And before that, he was a professor of math at the University of Chicago. Um, and he is currently a visiting professor at Princeton University, where he teaches courses on, uh, on high frequency trading. So Robert is widely known for his seminal work uh, on the Almgren Chris paper, a milestone in, uh, in algo trading and his continuous market microstructure research at, at QB. So without further ado, uh, Robert, over to you, and we look forward to your insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Rob. Merci beaucoup. Um, so I would just say that, like you guys, Quantitative Brokers is operating fully, uh, you know, fully operating through all of these events. Where we moved electronic, we're still, um, still executing on Montreal as well as on many other exchanges. And what I want to talk about today is, you know, really big theme of our ongoing research, which is how to model, predict, and uh, model, predict, and optimize transaction cost in futures markets, which it's a familiar subject in equities markets. The nuances of futures markets are somewhat different. So to set the stage, Quantitative Brokers is a trade execution company. So what we do is a client sends us an order, for example, buy a thousand CGB futures on the Montreal exchange, we execute that order. So we are not part of the decision what to trade or why to trade. What we try to do is get the trade done at the best price that we possibly can. So our goal is to get the best final average execution price. Um, but best price has to be defined relative to a to some kind of benchmark. I mean, good price just in the abstract doesn't mean anything. Benchmark defines what an ideal trade would be. Different benchmarks gives different strategies. So here's a couple of examples. Um, oh, sorry, one more definition. Slippage, which is the number that we live or die by, is the difference between the final average execution price and the benchmark price. So for a buy program, it would be execution price minus benchmark. And for bench for sell program would be benchmark minus execution. Um, and just to pause for one second, I saw somebody asked what was the paper that Luke mentioned. How about I say that at the end because it's a it's a well known paper. I'll come back to that at the end what the paper was. So the difference in final ex average execution price, execution minus benchmark for buys. This number is signed so that positive slippage is bad, negative slippage is good. Um, ideally, zero slippage would be would be execution at the benchmark. That's not always possible. So our goal, what we do day in and day out, the only thing we really care about is to minimize slippage on every order that we do. We also we talk to the clients about what their goals are, but the, but the absolute thing that we care about is the slippage number. And depending what the agreed benchmark is, the definition of slippage will be different, and that will give rise to different algos. Here are two examples. So here's an example from a bunch of years ago. The order comes in, this is a, this is a CME gold contract, so we're selling it. Uh, what happens is at the starting time, we snapshot the bid offer midpoint, which in this case is 1282.05, and then we execute, we're selling, the market is rising. So we get a bunch of fills, which are these orange triangles. <clears throat> these fills are generally above the initial price. So this orange line, which is the cumulative average execution price, we find wind up with a cumulative average execution of 1282.2, which is higher than the strike. So slippage was negative, <clears throat> and that was worth quite a lot of money. 
We also report slippage relative to average, execute, average price on the execution window VWAP, although that's not significant for this order. What we report here is the execution price cost to strike. One other example, um, just to illustrate that different benchmarks give rise to different algos, this is a VWAP order where the agreed on benchmark is the average market price during a time window, in this case 702 to 833, and the, we're trying to execute across, the, across that time window to get as close to or better than that average price. And so it does not mean we necessarily execute on a schedule. The algorithm is authorized to deviate from the schedule when and as necessary to try to get better prices. But for what I want to talk about today for the modeling is the arrival price benchmark and our bolt algorithm, which tries to target it. So arrival price uh, was on the picture. Let me say it again. An arrival price benchmark by definition is the bid offer midpoint from public market prices at the time of the order start. And once that snapshot, we then, we then measure all future executions relative to that. So this is a very clean benchmark because it's in the past once you start trading. None of the trading that you do can affect it because it was already, it was already recorded. It represents a notion of what the, an ideal trade would consist of. An ideal trade would be executed completely at the bid offer midpoint at the order start time um, and so, for example, buying at the offer would be half a tick slippage relative to that. Uh, but from a statistical point of view, and one of the reasons we focus on this is, well, we focus on it because it's the most important to most of our clients. We think it has the most economic significance because it represents the entire order being completed at a particular time, but it's the most challenging to model quantitatively. The reason is that as in the examples I showed, the base, single biggest contributor to arrival price execution quality is the direction of the market during the trade window. So if you're a buyer and the price comes down, you will look good, whether you're, you, will, you will look good. If you're a buyer and the price goes up, you will look bad because the market is moving away from you. From a statistical point of view, there's a lot of noise. Um, the, the, the statistical way to say that is that by using good statistics, we can get very good P stats on our coefficients, but very bad R squares on, the, on our ability to predict any order. And then another aspect is that um, one of the banes in my life the whole time I've been doing this is that market impact and alpha cannot be distinguished. So you put in the order to buy because you think the product the price will move up. So you start to buy and it moves up. Did it move up because you pushed it? Or did it move up? Did you correctly anticipate that it would move up? Um, and so it's moving up, would move up on its own. So here's the impact versus alpha. You anticipate a price impact, you enter a buy order, price goes up. Did it go up because of your trading or did you trade because you predicted that it would go up? There's a huge conceptual problem here that no action in the market is independent of what came before nor what is expected to come after. Our approach to that is to not try to distinguish these. People talk about sort of two different types of impact, one due to liquidity, one due to signal. We don't try to distinguish them. Our point of view is purely empirical <clears throat> because it's the most relevant to our clients. We simply look at what happened in the past. We take that as a given that that's the best, that's the best source of information about what's likely to happen in the future. And we make a statistical model that describes that. So the goal of market impact modeling, <clears throat> I would distinguish this into two different goals. You have to keep them both in mind. So at the simplest level, the, the, we, we have an obligation to provide to our clients some sort of estimation of what a cost will be. So the guy says, I'm planning to buy 500 10-year Canadian CGB bonds, bond futures over the next two hours what do you think my slippage will be relative to the pre-trade benchmark? So at a minimum, we need a model that says your slippage will be one and a half ticks, probably, just because the last time we did things like that, that's what happens. The second thing we'd like to get out of the model is, and it always immediately follows on the, on the heels of the first, the first question, is 
we'd like to express dependence on variables that can be adjusted. So when the guy calls us and says, what do you think it'll cost to trade it over two hours? We say one and a half ticks. He's like, well, that sounds like a lot. What happens if I only trade 200? How much will that cost? Or he'll say, what if I do four hours or five hours instead of two hours? How would the cost change? So the model also has to be able to answer those kinds of questions, which affects the kind of models that you make. Then ultimately the uses to which this is put is twofold. One is, talk about the second one first, is ex post analysis. So every trading firm should at a minimum have a record of every trade they executed and all the costs on it, and then some sort of analytical framework around it because this can help identify which particular products are difficult to trade, what brokers are doing a good job, what traders on the buy side desk are good or bad, and you need a model to somehow link these together, to somehow compare you know, very disparate populations. And then the other, the other aspect, which, which I actually mentioned in the first part, is you use this model to inform trade decision making. So if trading 500 CGBs is gonna cost one and a half ticks, maybe you don't really need to trade it. Maybe the guy says, you know, actually my, my alpha forecast on this is only half a tick, it's probably not worth doing the trade or maybe I'll do a much smaller trade. So, so you use these models to choose how to, how to actually execute the trade. And then in addition, you use the results to evaluate evaluate ex post what products what brokers and so on are good so the good thing about this about being in a broker is that we have a huge amount of data resource so you know this is our entire business we do this all day long every day for for a wide variety of clients in a wide variety of markets um, thousands thousands of orders per day and these are many different products, many different conditions. So for every order, we have lots of data variables recorded. So we have, what I'm highlighting here is parameters that were specified as part of the order. So what do the people want to trade, buy or sell, size, what start end times, there may be other parameters such as urgency associated with the trade. We have <clears throat> all market properties, everything you could possibly want. We have forecast models for traded volume, for traded volatility. And then we have all the detailed tick data during and before the execution window. And the only question we're trying to answer is for that contemplated 500 lot CGB order, what happened the last time we did that kind of order? And that's going to be our prediction. So this is a problem which is very sort of widespread for many time in statistics or now machine learning. So to just sort of pose the mathematical problem, there's one output variable, which is slippage, which is the, the cost of the execution cost relative to the benchmark, in our case, the pre-trade midpoint. And there are many input variables, called an X1 to Xn, which in principle could go into determining that. So these would, as I said on the last slide, parameters that are associated with the order that can in principle be modified, what's being traded, and so on and so forth. So it's some market parameters which are known before trading. So for example, we have a daily forecast number for volume and volatility that we determine using data up to D minus one. And then in addition, uh, to the extent they're relevant, we can generate real-time forecasts for volume, volatility, bid offer spread, quote size, anything you want up to the final time during trading. And then the other set of variables, which may be useful for ex post statistical analysis, but are not very useful for prediction, are parameters that are discovered during trading. So as I mentioned, the single biggest one is, did the market go up or down? If you put that in as a regression variable, you find fantastic predictivity, but it's not very useful for the purposes I outlined, which are pre-trade cost making to inform decision making. And then you also have, in addition to the price, you have, as we execute, there's the volume, what happened to the volume and volatility. But market parameters that are discovered during training are less useful for the statistical model that we're talking about. So the challenge with this stuff, which will become immediately clearer when I show you the, no show you the actual data, is that it's extremely noisy. So, so to put this in perspective, market moves because well, one way to look at how, why the market moves is because there are a lot of people trading. So we are typically a quite small fraction of the market, call it you know, 1% maybe. So there's 99 
other people like us who are trading and depending on the direction of their trading, they will essentially be random as far as we're concerned. So the impact of our orders is hopefully by design very small relative to the motions that the market makes on its own. So the slippage on any individual order depends on the direction of the market, which is which whose size is described by the market volatility, our slippage had better be much, much smaller than that on, on average. From a statistical point of view, a consequence of that is that the usual statistical approach of take a bunch of models, see which one gives you the minimum, say, mean square discrepancy against your historical data is hard to apply and doesn't really work very well because it never gets very good. I'll show you an example um, of fitting the exponent. So in this kind of modeling, I kind of laugh when people say, I'm just gonna let the data propose the model. The data is not gonna tell you anything. You have to use common sense to develop a model and to construct the model in such a way that it will be useful for the purposes that we outlined at the beginning. So we need a model that is simple enough for us to understand and that is useful for the purposes we outlined, which are, so for cost distribution, it has to have a reasonable fit to the data, um, knowing that an excellent fit is not possible given the inherent noise of the data, and ideally should be something that we can use to optimize. So that will, slide here, so, so come to it in a moment, but when we choose between parametric and non-parametric uh, statistical modeling techniques, we have a strong bias toward traditional parametric statistics types modeling because they're easy to understand and easy to understand what the parameters are um, as opposed to the more modern bag of techniques of machine learning, you know, um, uh, trees and so on. They're much harder to interpret, much harder to optimize. So what I wanted to talk about in the remaining 15 minutes or so is most in detail is single asset fitting for orders in the two prime Canadian products, the equity index, SXF, and the 10-year Canadian bond future, CGB. And then briefly, I'll talk about some of the issues that come up with multi-asset fitting across related products, why it's useful, but why it's, why it's difficult. So single asset fitting. The data resources I have that I'm showing you are SXF and CGB. I'm looking at orders that were executed by QB's Bolt algorithm. So the algorithm is designed to target arrival price. So the correct way to measure it is to look at the statistics relative to arrival price. I am grouping together all the clients together, except for a few, um, knowing that our clients are a very heterogeneous collection. Everyone is particular, everyone is special. They have different um, investment strategies, different horizons that are trading for different reasons. So since alpha and impact are mixed together, I'm very well aware that we're mixing together things that are not all the same. Um, we can, for particular clients, fit their own data. Sometimes those results are different, sometimes they're not. I will take a 16 month period from, there's a particular reason for wanting 16 months, which I'll show you in a few slides. Um, from January 2019 through the end of April 2020. This includes, and I'll highlight the challenges, includes the very anomalous period of March 2020 when volumes and volatility were, were high. I'll talk about how we modeled that. Um, a few more details, outright contracts only, so not spreads. Um, on each date, I take the most active contract. Um, I exclude orders in our system which had a limit price specified because a limit price really distorts the the statistics, obviously, you could make it so that all your orders have negative slippage only by setting a limit price. You say if it goes the wrong direction, just stop executing. So we only include orders with no limit price. We also exclude not only orders that were canceled before completion, because that also, that also distorts the result, but we, we also need to cancel, we need to exclude orders for which we think they might have been canceled if the market had gone in a different direction. So just like a limit order, if the limit order is present, but the order, even if it's not triggered, the existence of the limit order means that the orders that were not, where the limit was not binding are a biased sample. And we start with a strong hypothesis 
because our goal is to model market impact that the most important variable of all the ones I listed is the order size. And we have a strong hypothesis that large trades have higher slippage. So we're not totally starting with a, with a black box bag of data. We are looking for a model that captures most importantly the dependence on size. Also execution time, but I'll talk about the challenges of that. So that said, here's the data that we're looking at. So what I'm showing you is on the left, the SXF equity future, on the right, CGB, the Canadian bond future. Um, every dot is an order, parent order that was executed. So it's like the example at the beginning, buy 500 shares of, of SX, 500 lots of SXF. The vertical axis on all these pictures is always the slippage. So this is the number we care about. It's the execution price minus the bid offer midpoint normalized in this case as a fraction of the uh, minimum price increment. So zero would be executing at the midpoint, um, which is not impossible. Or it could have been that the spread was two ticks wide and we, we filled somehow at the midpoint. Um, plus a half, which is a common value, would mean that we crossed and we bought at the offer or we sold at the bid. And then we typically, for single lot orders, you know, it would typically be a multiple of a half, not necessarily. Um, positive is bad, negative is good. What you can see, the x-axis is a choice of modeling hypothesis among the many variables I could have put. I put the executed size in lots. So the executed size typically varies from one up to several hundred or several thousand characteristics of this data set are that the median size tends to be not huge. So, you know, a few dozen. Um, and one of the challenges in market impact modeling is that for day in and day out flow, most of the orders are not very big, but what, what matters is the cost incurred on the large orders. And so the challenge of the modeling is to get decent results for large orders for which we have very few, very few observations. The red bars are the histogram of where the orders are. So it's showing you most of them are sort of moderate size. Um, the, the bond, you know, we have sort of a range of sizes and then it tails off. And then I've also showed you the median order size and the weighted mean cost across all the orders weighting by the order size. So, so that's great. So this is the data. And what I would point out is that when you look at these points, it's not entirely obvious what kind of model would fit this. It's, it's, you can perhaps see that the distribution is skewed positive. So there's more points up here. Um, the mean, you know, down here, the, in fact, the axis scale goes further up than it does down, indicating the distribution is skewed. You can maybe see that there's a bunch of points up here. So large orders do cost more, but we can test that. So here's the same data. What I've done is in each bin, so this is a log scale. So bins are one to two, two to five, five to 10, so on and so forth. I've plotted the average, the green line is the average slippage within that within that range of sizes. Sorry, it's the average slippage within that range. And then the green band, the light green band is the standard deviation of the estimate. So what you see is yes, indeed, it does seem to justify that, that impact or slippage, realized slippage increases with order size. Um, pretty clear for SXF, maybe a little bit, you know, more noisy for CGB. In particular, you have you know, you have this, this few large, very few large orders here that had actually lower than the mean slippage. You have to design a method that doesn't get carried, doesn't get put off by that. So yes, it looks like um, execution cost increases with order. Again, impact versus alpha, maybe it's that when people have more conviction in their signal, they send, they send larger orders, maybe it's that the larger orders have more impact. We do not know the difference. Um, we can simply report what we see from our orders. So how do we model this data? So as I said, it's a classic statistical problem. The two big approaches are regression. So you write down a particular functional form. So you say y is some function of all the inputs. You parameterize it by some parameters, alpha, beta, whatever. Um, and then you, you usually minimize the residuals to, um, to get the, the smallest mean square residual. Um, it's easy to write down these models, it's easy to interpret them, whether they fit the data or not is a separate thing you have to evaluate. Um, in the modern world, there are many, many techniques for supervised learning. 
um, neural nets, trees, support vector machines. The, these things have had a lot of success. I advise a lot of students that take, instead of doing parametric modeling, apply some of these things, typically get much better results as measured by the ability to fit the data. But the difficulty with those is you don't always see what's going on and they're more difficult to use for the stated purpose, which is to adjust and optimize execution parameter. Then the other thing that I will say is before we toss in our data into one of these, one of these approaches, we need to introduce some structures. So I'm going to in particular begin out of the box by imposing two pieces of structure. So the first, so our modeling hypothesis is that the most important variable is order size. So we want to do cost as a function of order, of order size. But we know that traded volume and traded volatility go into this. And so we are choosing, um, and you can justify this statistically, but I'll just tell you for now, we are going to choose to or normalize the order size by daily volume and normalize slippage by daily volatility. So to be a little bit more precise, because it matters what these details are, for daily volume, this will be the total traded volume for the front month contract on that date. For the daily volatility, what we do is it's the square root of an intraday high frequency variance estimator across the entire day. So we measure variance across the entire day, take the square root of that, that's daily volatility. Um, a downside of this is that it includes contributions from information events, for example, on days when Canada is reporting its, its uh, unemployment numbers, which often overlaps with the US numbers. There's typically massive volatility at that time, 8.30 in the morning. This does not exclude that, so that's a defect. And actually for the fit, we, use a, we smooth it backwards in time with a three-day exponential average, which includes the current day, so it's not entirely useful for predicting. Um, if we wanted to use this for prediction, we would have to use forecast values that are available at the start of the trading day. Um, different discussion that's available, but this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm showing here. So here's what that data looks like. Again, on the left, the equity future, on the right, the bond. So blue dots here are daily volume. So what you can see is that um, for the SXF, much more than, for example, for the CME S&P, these huge spikes around the roll period, um, you know, lower in between, Volatility, fairly consistent, except this gigantic event in March 2020 because of the virus scares um, that posed its own challenges for modeling, which I won't talk about too much today, but um, we, have, we have approaches to that. But just to show you what the data looks like, the CGB also has these spikes, large changes in volume and volatility around the rule, huge increase in volatility, lesser increase in volume into March 2020. Then the other... Oh, and so here's the normalized data. So it's same data as before, except the x-axis, instead of being size and lots, is the executed size as a fraction of daily volume. So this ranges for both of these products up to a few percent. Um, and then the slippage is the slippage to midpoint, but measured now as a fraction of daily volatility. So typically a fairly small fraction, at most a few percent. So same data, just 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 plotted in a different axis. Again, you see a fairly clear, when you think of bin means, a fairly clear increase in average cost as a function of scaled size. Over here on the CGB, okay, there's a problem. There's no data at all in this region. There's some, you know, the data gets kind of noisy when you get out, but generally you'd say it increases with size. Then the other modeling assumption that I'll make is I'm going to say that there's a specific function F, which models normalized trade size, so it models slippage. So how much, what slippage is a fraction of volatility, some function of trade size is a fraction of volume. So what was this, how much did we move the market compared to how much the market moves on its own as a function of how much did we trade as a function, a fraction of what the market trades on its own. And in particular, this is all before, I'm not letting the market, the data tell me this, I'm telling the data what I want to model. I'm going to look for a model of the following form that f of x is a plus B times some fractional power of X, so X to the K. And then my criterion will be mean square residual, so I'm gonna minimize the square residual. And this is, I made a lot of assumptions before even going to the data. This, this is a very particular functional form, but you can take my word for it that this is consistent with a lot of data that we look at um, and is a pretty good workhorse for us. So in terms of the 
challenge of fitting this, let me just point out that the A and the B are really easy because you can just fit them, once you've, if you've chosen a value of the exponent K, A and B are just a linear fit, and then you have to do a one-dimensional fit over K to find the minimum. Um, so here's what it looks like. <coughs> um, I'm not showing you the picture for CGB because it looks terrible. Um, even for SXF, it looks kind of bad. Um, we'll talk about in a moment. So what I'm showing you on the left is what you get when you do this. This, the x-axis is the exponent k. The vertical axis is the mean square residual in these scaled units as a function of the exponent. So for each value of k, I do the linear fit. I measure the residual. I determine that the minimum residual occurs in an exponent of 0.2. And along with that are corresponding coefficients a and b. And if I plot that, I get this curve here, this, this green line. Um, and then around it, which is increasing, b is positive. And around it are these gray regions, which are the one and two standard deviations error estimates for that, um, for given the data. So it's fairly, the bands are fairly narrow through the part where we have a lot of data. They start to widen out for the part we're interested in, where we're starting to trade you know, more than half a percent daily volume. Um, you may say, wait a sec, exponent point two should be a concave function. Why is this line curved up? It's curved up because this is a log scale. <clears throat> so, so trust me, this is that exponent. But we don't actually like to do this optimization over the exponent. One reason is this picture, probably confusing, but I look at a lot of these. What I've done to make this picture is I've taken my 16 month period I've done the fit over the entire period, which is, that's the value I showed you here, the point two, it's this solid line. Then I've split the 16 month period into two periods of eight months, and I fit each, each half period, that's these lines. Then I've taken each of those eight month periods, split them into two, um, two four month periods, and then two months and one month and so on. And what I would expect to see is some sort of consistency um, just take my word, I've looked at a lot of these, this is not a good picture. This is very unstable, depending on what time period you look at, you get very different values for the exponent. So residuals aside, we are making a modeling choice that we're gonna fit the exponent at one half. So our model is going to be normalized slippage is coefficient plus coefficient times the square root of the normalized trade story. And A and B are easily determined by linear regression. And there's a strong reason for preferring the value k as a half. It's the only value that's dimensionally consistent because if you were to change the time interval t here one day, if you were to change it, say, to half a day or a week or an hour, then the, the volatility on that time period would, in a, in a Brownian motion model, scale like the square root of the time period. The volume would scale like the time period itself. So choice of this exponent one half is the only one that gives you dimensional consistency if you change the time interval in which you measure volume and volatility. So it's also consistent with literature. There's evidence in the literature that a square root model is um, best fits the data. There's a lot of reasons, theoretical and empirical, to prefer it. So super quickly, because I don't want to keep you guys too late, you can do the fit. You get, here it is, here's the fit with a square root to the, to the SXF. And actually it looks better because you have narrower error bands than the other picture. You get very narrow error bands through the part where most of the data is. They broaden out somewhat where the, you know, there's less data, but not too much. Um, for CGB, it's actually fairly flat. CGB is a very large tick market, so very deep quote size. Um, there's reasons this thing is fairly flat. Um, but this model can be used to give specific predictions. Here I've chosen one one hundredth of a percent at that one tenth of a percent and one percent of daily volume. And it gives me specific predictions for what the slippage would be as fractions of the volatility for those particular order size. And clearly because this is a smooth curve, you can, you can go back and forth on the um, choose, you know, the guy says, what if the time, what if the order was large or small or whatever. Now, and you can draw to draw the pictures. Um, the, this is the, these things have not only confidence bands, but they also have a covariance matrix. If I plot here, sorry, the, if I plot here the 
intercept A and the intercept B, this is the value that comes out of the statistical fitting. But these error bands just emphasize these things that the errors are highly correlated, not to go too much into that. The one point I want to make in the one remaining minute is, should we include speed of execution? This is the most important point. So it's common intuition that more rapid execution should cost more. And if you want to determine optimal trade schedules, it does not. The way we address this is to look at the residual in the fit as a function of participation rate on the execution interval. So what I've done is I've taken, I've fit the data as before. The red dots here are the difference between the actual data value and the fit value. And I've plotted them against the execution rate. So here we were 5% of the execution time. Here we were point, you know, here we were, um, no, here we were half of the market during that time. And just to make a long story short, if you regress on that, what you find is actually that faster participation has lower cost. Um, it clearly comes out of the data. And that may, may make you scratch your head and say, wow, you're saying we should trade faster to get lower cost. Actually, what's happening is in a bolt algorithm, because of our, our algorithms are opportunistic, the time of execution is strongly determined by whether the market is coming toward us or away from us. So if the market comes in our favor, we get quick fills at good prices. If the market moves away from us, we get slow fills at bad prices. So that is why we do not include the participation rate as an explanatory variable for slippage. It's important, but it's actually determined along with the slippage as an output of what the market does during the time interval. So I don't want to go too much over time. Let me just say to conclude, fractional power model gives reasonable agreement. We settle on exponent k equals 0.5. You want to fit the part of the, the, the range where most of the orders appear. It's important to neglect participation rate. Um, I didn't show you the picture. The model is reasonably stable. So it actually works through that event in March, actually gives fairly stable results. Um, and ideally, all I will say is like to combine the products to get better statistics. Um, they don't combine as well as you like. If you do the same thing, for example, for equity indices, here's the equity indices on different markets, URX, Montreal, CME Life, a reasonable hypothesis would be that the normalized coefficients are all compatible. Unfortunately, they're not. Um, so each market really has to be fit separately. All right, that is pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, coefficients are not necessarily consistent. You have to actually look, sometimes certain time periods are outliers. There's not a good way to combine different products and futures are more complicated than equities for which you can put them all into a single bucket. Okay, we, um, we will stop there. I will say to answer that question, the name of the paper is something about execution of portfolio transactions by me and by Neil Chris, happy to send you a copy. If you write me or write Neil, um, we'll find a copy. Okay, Neil, do you want to sort of no, wrap thanks it up? Very much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. Is ever a thoroughly uh, engaging presentation, and I'm sure it's going to continue to generate comment and, uh, and questions. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Neil Salter, and uh, I'm part of the QB sales team. Uh, I'm based in New York. So just a couple of things to wrap up. Um, as a, a final reminder, uh, Rob Domenko mentioned at the start, we're going to collate any questions uh, that either came through today or subsequently uh, uh, are submitted. Uh, and not covered, and we'll circulate that to, to Rob and his team, and we'll re respond uh, directly to the sender. Um, a few thank yous. Um, first to, to Rob Domenko and Christina, and the rest of the TMX team, and to our own Joyce Medeiros for all their efforts in uh, organizing today's uh, joint event. Um, our thanks go to Luke for his kind words of introduction this morning. Thank you, Luke. Uh, and finally, of course, to Rob himself for taking the time out of his schedule to present today. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'll keep my remaining comments brief, uh, as I'm sure today's audience are obliged to get back to their day jobs or, uh, or childcare, or in many cases both. Um, but I do want to mention that if we if we look at the number of today's uh, attendees, and in addition the caliber uh, of the audience, both in terms of the individuals and the institutions they represent, I think that makes a statement about the regard in which both the Montreal Exchange and Dr. Angram and QB are held. So thank you to everyone there. With respect to today's attendees, um, I do see uh, many familiar names, uh, many friends in fact, uh, as well as some that are a little less familiar. 
um, QB has always thought of its relationships with exchanges, with, the, with our clients, with, uh, with FCMs, uh, as true partnerships. And Joyce and I remain on standby to, to share in much greater detail exactly what Rob and Christian have built over the last uh, 12 years and how we help our clients solve uh, problems. Um, our contact details are on the invite. Um, and of course, if it feels more comfortable, um, then please reach out to our friends at TMX. And I know that Rob and Christina and the team will be delighted to, uh, to step in. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, stay safe and uh, have a good day ahead.